thank you guys for taking the time to come together. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for this having me. This is something special. Um, first, Ralph, you've been with Paul Stewart, uh, creative director here for... Well, I've been with Paul Stewart for 13 years, going on 14. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been creative director for the last four or five years. I was originally hired to help with the Phineas Cole collection and as the years went by I took over the collection 100% and I, five, six, seven years ago I took over the Paul Stewart men's tailored clothing and then when um, uh, the new CEO came on board, Paulette Garofalo, she made me um, creative director for the company. Fantastic. So Fantastic. That's, that's kind of it right now. Okay. Joseph. You've been dancing for how many years now? I've been dancing for uh, over 35 years. Over 35 years? Yeah. Tap dancing, beautiful. Um, I, I wanna get right into it with you gentlemen because one of the first things, you're both at, at least I can say this, I believe, you're both at the top of the game in your, your respected fields. Can I say that? Yes. <laughs> can I say that? Yes. You, you can say it. Yeah, you <laughs> I can, can say, say it. it. You, you may not it. admit it, but <laughs> I can say it. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get there one day, but you can <laughs> yeah, say yeah, it. Right, right, right. That's the attitude. Yeah. Is there such a thing as perfection? Ralph, I'll start with you. Definitely, you know, but it's, perfection is hard to come by because uh, you personally can be a perfectionist and you, you make a great collection and then you you think it's incredible and it, it sells well and everybody loves it, but then when you come back to it, you say, why'd I do that? I should have I changed this. I, I could have done things differently to make it better. Of course, it's too late by then, but you're constantly in this agonizing mm. you know, period of, uh, first of all, is it going to be accepted? And second, with, with me, I'm always looking at every, everything over and over and over and over again even with the, the, the display department, you know, when we put all the clothes together and I put the rigs together, and then I look at them and I say, well, like, what did I do that for? You know, I, I, I make them take everything apart again and start all over again. So I, 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 would, I, I can say I would like, I, I'm a perfectionist, but I'm, I, I never say it's perfect. Does uh, perfection exist, Joseph? Um. Uh, yes, I, I do think perfection exists, um, but uh, you know uh, it, it can it, it can exist if you uh, submit to the vision. Um, you know, but you know an artist's vision changes over time. So um, if you submit to the vision, because I believe um, uh, the vision in and of itself becomes its own thing, its own entity. You know, but um, as the creator of that vision, you know, sometimes your vision shifts and it changes. So as that shifts and as that changes, um, uh, your, uh, your idea of perfection changes, you know, so you have to uh, dip and dabble and you have to adapt. Okay. Yeah. There's um, an adage, an old adage, an old saying, um, you have to learn the rule, you have to know the rules, and they, there's so many different variations of it, but you have to know the rules before you can break them. Both of you guys are playing in an industry that's fixed. Mm -hmm. you know, and when I mean fixed, I mean there are rules, there are guidelines. How have you, I'm not even gonna continue that, I'm gonna let you continue it. How do you learn the rules to break the rules? Or how does that apply to you? Because obviously what you're doing, Ralph, isn't, um, it's suiting, it's clothing, it's menswear. It's been there, it's going to be there. But there's something different about mm -hmm. what you're doing. Okay, so tell me about the breaking of the rules, learning the rules to break the rules. Is that, do you apply that? Um, yes, and uh, for me it worked out in an unusual way. I, I when I, um, before I got into this business, I was unloading brick out of a train car in Flatbush Terminal, Brooklyn. <laughs> I grew up in East mm. New York, Brooklyn, and I had no drive, no motivation, no ambition. Mm -hmm. I was a total bum. And then I had to get photograph taken for the high school year yearbook. So I went to this clothing store, and they, I said I needed clothes. So they, they, um, dressed me 
and um, you know my hair was down to here and um, when I came back to pick up the clothes they said uh, you know uh, who's paying for this stuff you know and I said well, you know I don't know my mother or somebody will pay for it and uh, they said Do you need a job and I said uh, does it include unloading brick out of a train car <laughs> and they said no and I said I'll take the job <laughs> <laughs> so immediately I became the stock boy for the store mm. There was photographs of on the wall of uh, Hollywood movie stars from the 20s or 30s. I, 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 th the hair was all combed back and they were in beautiful suits. I took the picture off the wall. I went to the barber. I said, cut my hair like this. I bought a gray double-breasted suit, mm. never looked back. And then these guys that worked in the store, they were incredible mentors. Mm. They started to teach me about menswear. But they were classical guys. So like their style was, you know, very, dressy blue suits white mm. shirts crisp ties double-breasted suits they, they had this old world heritage in in their style and these were the only guys I knew and these th th and and that I I copied their style of dress and then as the years went by and I was uh, my career was moving forward and I've had other opportunities you know I moved into Manhattan uh, it was exciting. The, the, uh, I thought everybody was dressed well, even if they weren't. I had no <laughs> idea. Mm -hmm. The hustle and bustle, the city, uh, when the lights went down, it was like energizing to me. And um, I started to work for a man who um, uh, produced product in Italy, and he took me to Italy. And then there was a whole new awakening. And then I met how Italian guys dressed, mm -hmm. and there was another something about their style. And it was just this kind of evolution process that went on when I just kept soaking it all in and then you know you've, you find your rhythm you know to me I found my rhythm of what I liked and then to this day I still incorporate those traditions and how do I break them I might break them with new new shoulder constructions new new um, new um, silhouette shapes mm. how far can you go I mean in what what I do you can't go that far because it's not like, you know, Yoji, where he can do, you know, three sleeves on a jacket and <laughs> the third one is a scarf and everyone says, hey man, that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if I put that here, you know, I'm sure I'm gonna get fired. Yeah, right, He'll yeah, be shown yeah. the door. Right. So what can you do? You know, so you make new jackets, there's eight button DB. Yes. You make different things that, yeah. that have heritage to it. Like this jacket was, in, was a jacket that was, you know, inspired by jackets from the early 1960s. Mm. Oh, we changed a little bit here, changed a little bit shoulder shape change the fabric, change something, and you know, build a collection around these things and, and they become new. And so that's how I kind of operate. I, 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 all, everything that's in this store, tailored clothing-wise, Phineas Cole-wise, has some history in it, whether they're military-inspired ideas or um, hunting-inspired ideas mm. or equestrian ideas. All those beautiful things from menswear are, are there just new shapes, new silhouettes, and hopefully make, we can make them where they don't look like a, a costume shop. I got you. And people might not know why they're buying them, because, but, but they like them, but they might not know it's equestrian inspired, but there's something about it that they feel that they, they, they should own. Okay. So I, I stick to the traditions and try to just bend a little bit here and there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Joseph, with you, I know that, for example, tap dancing, obviously it has a history how important is knowing the history of, of the craft that you're involved in? How, how important is that in terms of for you now and moving forward? Yeah, it's, it's the ground that you walk on. You know, um, the, uh, as a tap dancer, um, you are, it is your responsibility to study the history. It's your responsibility to study the language um, uh, of the dance. Um, and um, uh, there, there, are, you know, there are a lot of folks who um, who just want to hurry up and get it, and just hurry up and um, you know be known and you know get a million likes and you know without without really taking that time and without really um, you know as some people would say pay your dues you know and and that's part of it studying the history. Um, 
um, being aware of your ancestors in the dance, uh, honoring your ancestors within the dance. Um, uh, the Nicholas Brothers, Bill Bojangles Robinson, John Bubbles, um, Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, and all of which I just uh, recommended has, uh, all of which I just stated has impeccable style. You know what I mean? Um, and you know, so that's part of it too. Um, you know, when you get on stage and how you, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it is the dance in, and, and it is the rhythm, it is the sound, but it's also how you present yourself. You dig? Yeah. So, um, so the history is very much important. In terms of um, challenges within your craft, what, what do you feel, Ralph, is like one of the biggest challenges for you right now? Well, besides COVID. <laughs> <laughs> besides COVID. Um, the challenge is always um, getting people to like what you do, a mm. uh, bigger audience uh, to uh, appreciate it and want to wear it and want to own it um, f for many reasons. Uh, I mean, for me, I put a lot of time behind each concept and the product. So, you know, if you're buying something from Paul Stewart, you're also buying a piece of history. It's just not something that, you know, we opened the closet door and, you know, we hung it on the rack. So much goes into fabric development, research on the periods of time that, uh, that the clothes are made. I, I love the history of menswear. I'm always l reading it about the Georgian age, Edwardian age, Victorian age, the 60s, the, these periods of, of clothing that uh, I, I admire, the 20s, the 30s, the silent era, I, uh, you know, style. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a constant research, you know, into the, into the product. So, you know, I, a lot of people may, might not necessarily know that and salespeople might not necessarily give them that information, but uh, I would like to let everybody know that when they do buy something here, they are buying a piece of history. It's exactly what Joseph just said about Fred Astaire and Nicholas Brothers and Bill Bojangles Robinson. They all had different style. They all had different take on what they did. They're all incredible dancers. And so is Joseph, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, w I would just hope that people, you know, they don't think they're buying a used car mm -hmm. when they're <laughs> buying some clothing here. They th they're, they're actually getting substance here. And it's also timeless. We're not doing things that are ridiculous that they have to throw out the next mm -hmm. season. You can wear them. Product is great. So I, I would hope that would all happen. Definitely. Um, one thing that I find, uh, I'm looking at us as we sit here and we, we, we have this conversation, we pretty much um, are wearing different things, all happen to be from Paul Stewart, Phineas Cole, um, but we could come from different walks of life within different professions, um, different paths, and yet there's that one thing in common that we share. Let's say in this case it's a sense of style and we we express it in different ways. You through tap, mm -hmm. you through creating a product for people to wear, clothing. Um, why is style? A and I feel like sometimes this is a conversation you can't really have with everybody because when you hear style, some people assume it means fashion. Okay, so that's a whole nother conversation that we choose not to have, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, but when we talk about style, why is that something that's important to you? Well, you know, I, when I, I agree with you, when I, when I think of style, I don't necessarily think of, you know, runway show clothes. I think it's about the individual. Style it is, is great manners, well-groomed. Mm -hmm. Style is being polite to people also. You know, the, the, the cherry on top is that you also look great, <laughs> you know, when you're being polite and nice to people. And uh, so that, that, to me, ha that's, that's style. And, uh, you know, an attitude that, you know, you convey, you know, not a cocky attitude, but just confidence and, and you, you know, you, you're like a great guy, you know, and people want to be around you and, and uh, not like following you where you go, but when you're in the room, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Joseph, how about I with totally you? Agree. I totally agree. I totally agree. It's, it's who you are, um, you know, uh, when you, when you, when you're in your style and you're in your groove, you feel good, you know, um, you know, and uh, you know, for me, it's um, 
you know, it's like when I step outside the crib, it's like I got to feel good. You know <laughs> what I mean? I'm not, you know, just because I'm running to the store doesn't mean that I'm just going to throw on, throw on anything. You know what I mean? Um, it might not be this to wear to the store, <laughs> but, but at the same time, I just, have to, I just have to feel good. You know what I mean? And um, yes, it's, uh, it's how you treat yourself. It's how you treat others. Um, it's an extension of who you are. You know what I mean? I, I can't help but believe that if you feel good, those around you are going to feel good as well. It's something that almost seems to radiate, I think. Um, and I find that with both of you gentlemen. I feel that in, in your presence, we have these conversations. This isn't the first. It won't be the last. After, for myself, after I leave you guys, there's always this energy that, that goes with me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost as if I get a little piece of you, which I find, and I appreciate that. It's golden. And I appreciate that not only I get this in conversation with you, Ralph, but also in the clothing that you, you, you create. Um, so I can walk with a little bit of Ralph with me when I walk down the yeah. street. Mm -hmm. And with you, Joseph, I think that it's the same thing. It's the same feeling in terms of after seeing you perform. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing you when you did a little something for us uh, on Madison yeah. on the street, yeah. in, in the street. And just to see that and to remember those moments after, mm -hmm. it, you can't help but smile. Well, that's exactly how I felt about Joseph the first time I met him. When you, when you put the clothes on, we, you put him in the, the overcoat and mm -hmm. he turned the corner and he like just walking down the street with his <laughs> swagger and confidence. And I'm saying, that's the, thing, that's the guy, that's the, this is the guy, you that's know, it. who gets the clothes, lives, he, you, know, the, you know, you wore the clothes, the clothes didn't wear you. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, oh man, like this is so cool. And uh, when you were tapping in the street, dancing in the street, I filmed it. Like, I was so excited. I had my camera out there going crazy. No, that's cool. And it was just an amazing experience, short-lived, but amazing. I think you are, you're a pretty amazing guy. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, br 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 brilliant times, brilliant times. And, the, um, and you, know, the, uh, you know, the style has something to do with that. The fashion has something to do with that. You know, um, you know your, your confidence, how you walk down the street. Um, what you say and how you say it and who you say it to, you know? Um, yeah. Hmm. You, before we actually had this conversation, before we sat down, we actually started talking about something and I wasn't necessarily gonna bring that back out now, but I, why not? Um, I remember I asked specifically in your next lifetime, who or what would you be? Ralph, what did you answer? <laughs> A silent era movie star. And Joseph? A jazz singer. And why? Why again? Um, well, um, uh, I love, I love uh, vocalists. Um, and even as a tap dancer, um, sometimes when I'm tap dancing, I'm thinking melodically. I'm thinking, um, I'm trying to, uh, w what, what would uh, uh, Sarah Vaughan sound like? You know, or what would um, uh, Prince sound like? You know, uh, if, if their taps were, um, uh, if their vocals were transcribed through tap dancing, you know, so so maybe next time around, you know, I, I do it the other way around, you know, <laughs> be a be a singer and, uh, and scat scat rhythms out. That's interesting. It, it, so I'm curious to hear for you, Ralph. Um, you said from uh, an actor from a silent movie era. Why? I'm fascinated with silent era movies. You know, I think they're you know the lighting. Um, is amazing. The, the, they were all about faces, and um, there was just something like super romantic to me about a lot of those movies. Now, I don't love every single silent mm -hmm. era movie that came out, but the ones that I do love with John Gilbert and Greta Garbo and a few others there, there was just this glamour, this romance, and it, it's a fantasy, of course. You know, what am I going to come back at? Come back as, you know. Um, uh, but the, I just felt that uh, that period of time, that movie-making period of time uh, before the talkies, it was just an amazing period. And uh, I'm fascinated with uh, just, like I said, the lighting and the, and the faces and the characters and, and uh, the clothing, you know, which is a big part of it. So I would like to uh, dabble in that, you know. It's interesting that you say that because I'm listening and with Joseph in particular, with Joseph, it's as if your next life, you'll do what you're doing in this life. Exact same thing. And with you, it's the same thing. Um, the acting, the faces and all that, it's pretty much what you're doing with the clothing. It's, this is what, th you recognize a person by what they, how they present themselves. 
And in this case, in this lifetime, it's through the clothes that you create. It, it's just a different period of time. It would, it, would, it would just be, you know, maybe a different style, maybe, who knows what it would be, mm -hmm. but it, it, we still love the same things. Yeah, definitely. Actually, there was something else I did want mm -hmm. to ask both of you. There's, there's always, in terms of, for example, with music, I think that the people that some people are drawn to, at least for me, myself, I, I'm drawn to, I don't want to say suffering, However, mm -hmm. I'm drawn to the voice that, that touches the soul. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to hear the light, fluffy stuff sometimes. I mean, maybe in passing, but I want to hear something that's soulful, that really touches me, that helps me along the journey, so mm -hmm. to speak. They say that some of the best artists are the ones that suffered the most. Without going too far in these deep holes. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, there's something about the experience that you've had that has, that, that, that has allowed you to create such beautiful work, a beautiful body of work, mm -hmm. without necessarily getting into what that suffering may have been, but there is something there. Mm -hmm. I could see it in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I see it. Huh. So tell me a little bit, um, my, if you don't mind, Ralph, tell me a little bit about what is that part, that soul part that's allowed you to create that helped you create what you've been doing all these years? Well, I think um, one of the things is that um, you can be individual your, yourself when you have an opportunity to create. And you don't really have to be surrounded by 30 people telling you, you know, what to do. If you have an opportunity to be yourself, create product, and get it produced, then uh, I think it's a great thing. But um, the, for me, um, it's always about being back at Flatbush Terminal mm -hmm. unloading brick out of a train car. Like, I, I don't want to be there, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I wake up in the morning and I'm working for another company, you know, I, I got to give it my best shot every day I walk in here so someone doesn't say, hey, Ralph, you know, we <laughs> like you, but we don't like you that much. I it's been swell. That. See yeah. you later. I respect that. So, you know, it's a, a fear of the unknown. It's a fear of, of uh, failing, the fear of people telling you your product is terrible. So it, 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 it keeps me on my toes to try to do the best th that I, I can. I got you. So um, I can sleep a little bit better at night. I got you. Yeah. Joseph, I know, I can only imagine, I can't say I know, I, I can only imagine that sometimes when you're tap dancing, I don't want to say there's an anger. <laughs> I don't want to say there's an anger, but there's almost, I can't help but believe there has to be this, this feeling, this thing deep down in your gut that allows you to dance on somebody's soul, <laughs> you know, to, yeah, to, yeah. to leave an imprint Mm -hmm. in their mind. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? What is that? What, what's going on? Um, well, we could speak all day about that. <laughs> but, um, you know, 